Well, thank you to all of our great um, panelists for being here. Thank you to the audience. Um, as somebody who works for Vanity Fair, I'm a big fan of storytelling. And one of the things that I love about engaging with the tech world about the question of storytelling is the creativity that they bring to it, um, not just in terms of kind of distribution, but also the kind of weird ideas like Elon Musk talking yesterday about how we're just a projection of a video game of someone else who's playing us. And that brings us to the really practical question of if we are a video game, who's monetizing that? <laughs> and so, because that's one of the things that we're constantly running up against with digital storytelling or regular storytelling is how are we going to make money off of any of this? And that's the subject that we're going to talk about today. We've got a great group, all with a different perspective. Um, we're going to start, um, Ev Williams, who is the CEO of Medium, um, also the co a co-founder of Twitter and the largest individual shareholder, we think. Largest individual, he doesn't know, so that's what we're going to say. Um, and Shane Smith, who is the CEO and founder of Vice, co-founder <clears throat> of Vice, um, which is sort of genetically programmed to create envy and fear in the minds of uh, <laughs> old media executives. Uh, Tim Armstrong, who is the CEO of AOL, uh, started out being the first ad seller at Google, the first the person who was running the ad business at Google. Um, and Laura Desmond, CEO of Starcom Media Vest, um, who knows probably as much about the digital advertising business as anyone. I'm thrilled to have all of you here. Um, I wanted to start with a, a quote, and just to put it to all of you, um, because there's, there are a lot of questions right now about the kind of model that we're going to be able to have for digital content. And um, this comes from Bob Hoffman, who is, you might know, he's a critic of the ad industry. Um, but he says, I can think of nothing that has done more harm to the internet than ad tech. <laughs> it interferes with everything we try to do on the web. It has cheapened and debased advertising and spawned criminal empires. How does it really feel? Yes. Him, yeah. him, <laughs> as someone who just sold your company for $4.4 .4 billion to Verizon, um, what do you have to say about that because the reason that people, every, I kept reading stories saying the real reason that uh, Verizon bought AOL and it was not, didn't have anything to do with the content, it was all about ad tech. Right. So tell me. Yeah, so first I think, um, you know, I think advertising on the internet over the last 20 years has gotten slightly less crappy, but it's, uh, there's a huge opportunity and I think if you think about really what the internet's been great about, it's been inventing and if you look at, uh, it's an inventor's paradise right now because you have Essentially, over the next few years, you're going to have 3 billion additional people getting connected to networks. You have massive uh, powerhouse creatives starting to really focus on digital. You heard from James uh, before. And from an advertiser standpoint, you're essentially going to have an always-on connection with, with uh, consumers overall. But the biggest thing that I think it needs to change in advertising is uh, software is like oxygen. And if you think about a consumer right now and a consumer in the future, that oxygen is essentially attached to a mobile, f mobile phone. I call it a machine, but it's essentially a second brain. And that's Wait, why do you call it a machine instead of a mobile phone? Because uh, it's really a machine. Most people don't use their mobile phone for phone. <coughs> uh -huh. They use it for yeah. other tasks. And, um, and over time, that second brain as a marketer or a content producer, you're going to have to essentially interact with two brains, the real human brain and this machine brain overall, and that machine brain will help put in a lot of quality and a lot of improvements in advertising. And I think you see consumers ad blocking right now. It's because, you know, essentially people are disrespecting, we, we do it as well, disrespecting consumers' time and interaction with advertising. And it's a really big problem, but it's also a really big opportunity. And I think the companies that essentially focus on quality and advertising as a service or sponsorships as a service, you know, there's never been a bigger opportunity than the start of the internet right now. Internet went from offline to online. The jump from online to mobile is going to dwarf anything that happened in the last 20 years. And whoever figures out the ad models behind it are going to make a tremendous amount of money and they're going to have a tremendous amount of consumer loyalty. When you talk about the machine brain making that content and that kind of targeting smarter, um, it seems like that that's, that's not entirely intuitive because one of the things we keep hearing about now is how much of web traffic is not human? How, much, how many bots are out there um, watching the ads that people are serving? Um, and I'm wondering, for somebody like Shane, 
do you guys keep track at all of the kind of traffic that you get, whether it's an actual human being watching that or whether it's somebody else or something else? Um, we do. Uh, we're lucky in that, you know, we, um, we don't have to do any of that stuff because we're actually sold out of all of our inventory. We can't make enough inventory. You know, our ability to sell out paces our ability to scale. And so that's a good problem to have. Um, we do a lot of research uh, on our traffic. And as Tim knows, um, and I agree with him what he's saying, I think there's a tremendous opportunity because of ad blocking to actually go to brands and say, look, let's do a deal where we sponsor the show. And I think native advertising was all the rage, but then the economic model doesn't really work a lot of the time unless you do it on all three screens. So unless you do it on mobile and online and on TV. And I think that the companies that can actually provide that service to say, I'm gonna make Vice World of Sports and I'm gonna get it sponsored by beer. And then that brand then makes that halo of media. We make the halo of media around it. And then they buy that halo every time you license it so you make money by sponsoring, by selling, and then by creating the media around that. And I think going forward, you're gonna see a consolidation of companies that can do that, as well as create media, and the companies that can't will go the way of the dodo. But where we are now feels kind of a long way from that. Um, I don't think so, because I think you've got programmatic, which is gonna dominate on the base, and programmatic is doing what the internet's done since the beginning, which is a downward pressure which means you have shit. And then you have the premium, which is what everybody's going for in that space right now, today. And so the premium is what I just said. The premium is you can go to a brand, you can say, I'll make your media for you, which will outperform your 30 second spots. I'll make the show for you. You get into a new revenue stream. You get to be a content producer. All brands have to think of themselves as media brands, all that stuff. And that's the fight. The fight is for that top 10%, the real high CPM dollars and the Downward pressure of programmatic is going to clean out everybody else. It's going to clean out everybody else. Yeah. Can you describe, Laura, for people what programmatic is? Because I was trying to figure it out before this panel, since it seemed like I should know something about ad tech or programmatic. And someone in preparation sent me a, a deck, and the subject was WTF programmatic. <laughs> <laughs> And I have to say that even after reading it, I had the same question. So try to answer sure. that for the audience. So, you know, programmatic or electronic trading exchanges are essentially a way to uh, automate all buying. Um, their rise has come very quickly. Um, there's a demand side component to it. So agencies and clients, there's a sell side component to it, publishers. Um, there has been uh, an oversupply in what has been made available to buy and to sell. Uh, and that has created a downward pressure on pricing, uh, in part because um, you know, there's, in theory, infinite inventory on the internet. And in theory, it's better to sell it for a dime or a nickel than not sell it at all. But what we're beginning to see is the real smart marketers uh, and the smart publishers are recognizing that the downward pressure combined with messaging and content that doesn't really add a lot of value, mm -hmm. doesn't create an experience, is being avoided. It's no different than the remote control of this is where years ago. This is ad blocking and people- Ad avoidance, ad blocking. And right. so I think we're early into the game of programmatic, but I think the game is gonna shift and pivot quite dramatically to marketers and publishers and digicos who can absolutely use data to inspire better content, better messaging, and better premium uh, uh, inventory so that we can engage and create an experience uh, that people want to consume. But isn't, um, I mean, given, isn't ad blocking one of the most popular apps that's being downloaded? What's to prevent people from just blocking everything, even the premium stuff? I mean, why would I? Isn't that a big, big problem for the industry? <clears throat> well, you know, we live at a time of disruption. We live at a time where there's some extremes. We live at a time when people are saying, hey, I want to block it. 
We live at a time where people say, I want to watch it. I mean, four out of the top 10 uh, videos on YouTube this year have been ads for Nike, for AB. So, and we've seen with some What's of our, uh, Anheuser-Busch. Anheuser-Busch. So we've seen both. Uh, this isn't about ads, this is about the experience. And we are all, I think, collectively owners of the experience. And we need to increase uh, 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 the, you know, the engagement by bringing people not only what they want to see, but entertaining and, 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 and giving them value. When consumers see that publishers and marketers and, and, and messaging is giving them value, they'll stick around for it. You can't block a sponsorship either. You can't block a sponsorship. So if ABI yeah. sponsors Vice World of Sports, then they're a producer, they get a produ producer's credit, and, uh, and, and people get that. They say, oh, you're bringing me something I like, the brand is bringing me something I like, they, there's no noise around it, it's a better UX, and they pay a premium for that. That's what I'm saying about the, right. the premium space, is you can't block sponsorship. Right. It's part of the thing. They're a producer of that thing. Ev, you wrote something a few, a little while ago, um, called an inch deep and a mile wide, and it was it went viral, um, and it was essentially, you say it was a rant um, that was the result of increasing frustration with the one dimensionality of those who report on, invest in, and build consumer internet services, and the way they talk about success, and it was the notion that we're all obsessed with the number of views versus an actual person having an experience with a piece of content online. Could right. you explain a little bit more about what was so frustrating to you about that? Sure. Um, I think the, it relates to the advertising discussion, but it's much broader than that. And it started um, with an interview. I was asked what I thought of Instagram being bigger than Twitter because they announced they had 300 million users. And um, then I said a bunch of stuff and then ended up with, I don't give a shit about Instagram. Wait, can you- Not entirely I, true. Um, can, can I stop you? Can, you? can you remind everybody what exactly you said? Um, I said, so the point was number of users, when, when it comes to consumer internet primarily, number of users is the metric, um, usually measured as monthly active users, which even that, even if you dug into what that actually means, it's quite suspect because it, it doesn't mean someone really used something necessarily. But even if you take that on face value, then that being the metric of size and, and what's implied in that is value created is a very distorting metric. And it makes sense in a couple of cases if you're selling the type of advertising where obviously advertisers often want to reach as many people as possible, but it's never been taken into account in the history of web advertising, the difference between a one second page view and a 10 minute article read. And with lots of these consumer apps, even if they're not advertising driven, uh, then, then what someone is actually doing there is uh, not taken into account by a number, number of people either. So I just think when we, when we talk about the size of a, of a company or value being created, I remember working at Google 10 years ago, obviously once Google was selling ads, that was a very important metric, but the chart on the wall, the crayon chart was number of queries. The number of queries was, we'd, what Google focused on is number of queries, that meant they were always trying to make queries better and more useful and faster because that would mean more queries. More queries is a much better proxy for value delivery than number of people querying. Mm -hmm. If you look at Apple, if, they, if Apple optimized for number of people buying their products, they would probably not be the most valuable company in the world because they would have to you know, reduce profitability and, and make cheaper and cheaper products. But that's what we do in consumer media is we say, how many people can we get to touch this product? And so that, that was the basis of my rant. And I think what you said was, and I don't want to, you said, I don't give a shit if Instagram has more Yeah, if, users if than all these things, so Twitter plays this important part in the world where, where world leaders are talking to each other and people are getting real time information about disasters or protests and all these other things. It's a, it's a utility in many cases, in its best cases. Um, it's also a lot of other things, but the point was, if we don't talk about that, what it's actually doing for people in the world, and 
and we only talk about how many people showed up, then we're not talking about the right thing. Um, I agree with you. Um, and Twitter is an interesting, it's an interesting pivot to talk about Twitter because there is this, it does provide uh, a great service. Everybody I know is on it and we're talking to each other on it. People are tweeting at their husband who they could talk to at home at the same time. I don't understand why that, that happens. But um, you've just gone through a long CEO search and I appreciate you choosing um, Jack in time for the panel because I knew that was what was probably driving your timing. But um, if we hadn't have, then I wouldn't have to talk about it at all because I could just say no, no oh, comment. Right? Well, then thank you even more for, for doing it in time. The, um, I mean, I think the question for Twitter, and people were talking about this a little bit yesterday, is it gets the stock gets beaten up somewhat unfairly because it's still an incredibly successful company, but they've really been struggling with this question of if you have an audience people who are really engaged, but monetizing that and making money off of those people has not always been incredibly obvious. There are some new products that are coming out that people have been waiting a long time for to make it more usable, make Twitter more usable and easier to sort of um, access for people's mothers and, and people who are kind of new to the platform. Can you talk about the way you think about that on the board of where's the company center on that question? Do you want, when you say you don't want, you, don't, you know, it doesn't matter, you don't give a shit if it has uh, fewer users than Instagram, who is your, who do you want to be? Which the is not what I said, but. <laughs> oh, what, what, tell me. It's, I, what I said is that's the wrong measure. And so if you're measuring the size of something, you have to measure in multiple dimensions. I'm not saying throw out number of users yeah. in lieu of something else. It's number of users no, important. It's breadth and depth are important. I understand. And so, um, Obviously, we want more users, and we are confident we can have a lot more users on Twitter. 300 and some million people use the product every month, but that's, that's a metric that we are basically forced to re report, and, um, but that's a lot of people. What was your question? <laughs> I think my question was, when you look at Twitter and the sort of, or, you know, the fact that um, the, the origins of Twitter and the kind of free speech that happens on Twitter and that that's not always the most conducive thing for uh, Procter & Gamble to come on and put an ad next to that. I mean, how do you balance that as somebody who is um, a founder? Well, it's worked great. I mean, the, the, the monetization part of Twitter has been, um, it's gone really well. And, and we... People questioned it from day one, and it was funny because the conversation the first couple of years of Twitter was, oh, sure, it's popular, but how's it ever going to make money? And now it's, oh, it makes money, but nobody uses it. <laughs> um, and, but it always, it's a real-time information service that's incredibly unique, and it's been mobile-based since the beginning. And, and it's also not been focused on, it wasn't a social network primarily from the beginning, so we had commercial usage million people in, I think, 2008 or nine, before we started monetizing at all, we saw a million people sign up to follow Starbucks, which meant we want marketing messages delivered to our phone on a regular basis, and we're opting in for that. That is incredible commercial value, and we saw that companies large and small, for we, Twitter formed this connection between brands like Nike that never, didn't really have a communication channel with their, their ultimate customers. And um, now it's a major source for customer service as well as sales and marketing. And so that's, there's a robust business there that we've only scratched the surface on with the number of users we have today. So we've never really seen it as a conflict. And that's the beauty of, of the, the ad model on Twitter that it is tweets. It's the exact same unit. They can be spread throughout the system. So it, that part's always been very powerful and I think it can be, it, as the utility of Twitter grows and the user base grows, the business naturally grows along with it. Yeah. Hey, so one thing I'll just yeah. say is uh, Ev hit on it. You said when we started that you, I was the ad salesperson at uh, Google, but Omid Khorastani is in the audience. I think he was really the founder of Google's business side. But Sorry. Uh, that chart that was on the wall at Google when we all worked together, there was a second chart that wasn't on the wall, which was the performance of the advertising. And yes. So we used to have these Friday meetings, uh, which uh, probably hasn't been told enough, but basically on Fridays we'd sit down and there'd be a list of all the advertisers and how the ads were performing. And ads that had below a 1% click-through rate, which was 10 times the average performance of an ad on the internet, 
would get, Larry and Sergey used to send this note out and they'd say, shut all these advertisers off. And this would be General Motors, Ford, and so you'd, we'd, be, we'd fight with them and then we'd go to call the advertiser <laughs> and you'd say to the advertiser, sorry, we're shutting your ads off because you only have a 1% click-through rate. And the advertiser would say, the lawyer remembers this, what, I'm ten, that's 10 times my average click-through rate. And we'd say, sorry, it's not our, our quality threshold. And if you think about advertising today on the internet, if you look at Facebook and Google, and I would argue, I think Twitter, by the way, doesn't get enough credit for how well you guys have done uh, in advertising. Uh, that quality threshold, and I, I sent a note out to our team last year, I was watching one of the NFL playoffs games, and the same ad on TV ran five times in a half hour. Same ad, same client in general. If you go to the internet today, you can see the same ad five times in general. At Google, you won't see that because there's a quality threshold uh, put in. So as much as there was a quality threshold on queries and searches, the fact of the matter is that Google was shutting off the highest performing advertisers on the internet at the time to get them to perform even higher for consumers. That's sort of the, men the mentality right now of what the internet's facing. The ad blocking is because nobody's holding quality thresholds in advertising and everyone can run anything they want. And that's not a long term. I think, I think the other thing, Sorry. the other mentality that's going on right now is, I mean, you, you look at, you know, my company made a major investment on behalf of Procter & Gamble and Samsung and Coca-Cola in Twitter pre-IPO because we really liked how it performed in very short periods of time when you needed to drive action. And I think, you know, I was with Jack and Adam yesterday, and I think that what kind of underlines what Twitter is going through We've seen every major Digico go through it. In 2012, it was, is Facebook going to make it to mobile? Mm -hmm. And now they have. Is Facebook going to figure out how to monetize? And now they have. Google's gone through its high points and some, some valleys. Um, you know, Twitter's doing it now. Obviously, there are other companies uh, who are. And so the, thing, the common denominator here is this is going to happen. This is natural because people, consumers, the audiences we all want to reach when you're advertising products and you're selling um, uh, media inventory, they're, they're out ahead. They're using technology. They're using mobile phones. They're using the devices that companies are creating to essentially chase the next thing of entertainment, of interest. And so as companies go up and down these cycles, we're naturally going to uh, uh, follow consumers and audiences. And then other companies will figure that out and they'll leap ahead and they'll leap ahead. And that kind of market learning, in my opinion, is really healthy, and it's natural. And um, you know, the question isn't so much, you know, is Twitter going to do this or is Facebook going to do that? It's, okay, what's next? What's the next disruption that's coming that's going to force everybody else to react in a different way? What is that while we're on the topic? <laughs> Good question. I, 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 I uh, just say one thing about metrics yeah, and, 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 and monetization, is it seems to me that monetization is always two revs behind what the metrics are supposed to be. So for example, when we were coming up with online video, we were one of the first there, uh, along with you guys, you know, <clears throat> it was page views. So somebody looks at a page with three right. lines on it, that's the same as somebody watching 30 minutes of video. Right. And so that much is obviously stupid. Then engagement became the biggest thing, and to go back to your metrics, it's all about O and O. Well, how much do you have on your O and O? How much do you have on your O? Who fucking cares how much you have on your O and O? If you What's can monetize it on What's YouTube, if you can monetize it, owned and operated. Owned and operated. So, okay. Vice.com. So everyone will always say, oh, you know, we're doing over 200 million uh, uniques, but you know, that's some on Facebook, some on YouTube, yeah. you know, some on uh, Yuko or Todu, some on TV, some online. We don't care where it lives. We're platform agnostic. It can be on uh, mobile, it can be online, it can be TV, we don't care. But if you can monetize that, that's all that matters. Whereas the metrics are still, and Twitter's getting dinged for this, as oh no, and you're like, who cares where it lives? As long as you're making money off of it, and as long as people are watching it, it should be everywhere. That's a good um, introduction. I want to show a clip of a Vice video, um, that, an interview that you did recently with President Obama. Mm. Um, and it's something that you guys have essentially used in really interesting ways and repurposed and put on all different kinds of platforms. Let's watch the clip and then I want you to talk a little bit about it. I didn't know my dad. Uh, and uh, you know, too many of our young people don't know their dads. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, uh, for them to be able to see you uh, in, in a strong, positive way, uh, you know, that's going to have an impact. I met my dad for one month when I was 10 years old. That was the only time I met him in my whole life. 
even that little one month ended up having an impact on me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the kids are paying attention even when they act like they're not. That's right. I have a teenage boy that's, that's out there. I have a 15-year-old, 17-year-old, and I got a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old that's coming up. My main thing is the, they need to be busy. You know, because when I was growing up, I didn't have nothing to do at all. Where'd you, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Kansas City, Kansas. Hey, everyone. Yesterday, Governor Chris Christie challenged... He made a quick cameo. Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> He's everywhere. <laughs> he just photobombed the um, video. <laughs> so first, before we talk about you know, the ratings on that and how, yeah. where you've shown it, I want to just ask, what kind of preparation did you do with um, President Obama that got him to that point where he talked about his father in that way? Because I thought they were so moving. None. You just said I mean, go we in hung and out. We have, a good, we have a good uh, rapport. I mean, he's, a, he's very concerned about a lot of issues that affect a lot of people that just haven't been under the spotlight. And so to be able to shine a spotlight on these issues with his participation um, is, is a unique uh, opportunity. Um, and so how did that, how did that do? How did that, when you, got, you guys showed Well, I mean, HBO, HBO is very smart because HBO and a, lo a lot of the discussion here is about what's no old media, new media, and all these things. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and we, we actually, you know, are, are, are in all different forms. And so we, they all have different problems. You know, but I used to say if everyone's talking about online, then you've lost the battle because the, the battle is all mobile now. But I, th I don't think that's true either. I think that it, now it's everything. Now you need three screens, one screen OTT. And if you don't have a strategy to program all those things and to make content that's complementary for all those things, then you're going to be an also rant. So I think HBO is very smart because they realize this and what they're doing with HBO now. Um, and they, you know, there's a lot of fighting because people want to have exclusivity on TV. It has to be exclusive. You can't do day and date, especially the big stuff. And HBO, which is remarkable, let us run the special the day after it ran on HBO for free right. on YouTube. We did a, a, a takeover of Snapchat. Um, you know, we put it out on Facebook. We put it out everywhere because we were saying, look, it ha it's an important thing that we want to force legislative change, which is actually happening. And so they let us put it everywhere. And because of that, you know, we would have got, let's say, a, a three or four million audience, and that went to a 23, 24, and cuming. It's right. still going. I mean, the thing is, is that under the old, in the old world, HBO would have held on to that and said, we've yeah. got an exclusive interview with President Obama. We're going to re-air re that a couple of times and yeah. milk it for as much as we can. So it's very interesting. They sort of like opened up the doors. We're going to um, go to questions in a minute, but I want to ask Ev about Medium. Um, and it, the, because it's such an interesting project, but I, um, and I love reading it and, and using it, but if you weren't, if you hadn't, um, if you didn't have Twitter, if you did, hadn't done Twitter and become a billionaire with Twitter, would have you done, been able to approach Medium in this way? Or is it somewhat of a luxury to be And able, what do you mean by in this way? Um, to not worry so much about how much money it's making or to not, um, do you buy traffic on Medium? Do we what? Buy traffic? No, we don't. We don't buy traffic. Other people have bought traffic to Medium for you know, branded content, uh, but we haven't, and, and we've sold branded content on there. I mean, I think the question that people have about Medium is, is it, is it a luxury for you? Is it sort of not a vanity project, but is it something that you can pursue and you don't have the immediate kind of concerns that another <laughs> startup would have? Um, I don't think about it that way. I just raised $57 million, so I hope my investors uh, don't hear that. But I, don't, I think there's very clearly a, um, a large business. I mean, there's what's, the way we think about it is, in the next few years, as more and more of our attention goes to, and media consumption goes to our, our mobile devices and going, at least for the next little while, through apps, the web, that's not a level playing field like the web was. And the web allowed anyone, especially once blogging tools were mainstream, to set up a site and to speak freely. And sometimes what they had to say was important, and organizations and individuals did this in the millions as well as media companies. And that's part of what makes the web great. And that 
uh, that level playing field is actually sort of disintegrated when it comes to mobile and people mm -hmm. aren't going to go to as many websites. And so Medium at its heart is really about giving everybody that a, a platform again that um, hopefully will have a very large number of, of people consuming on a regular basis and where people who have important stories and ideas will find their right audience as efficiently as possible. And so that's what we're trying to do with Medium. I think like Twitter and like any other content platform, there is a business there. I think there's a couple different ways that we can build it. We have done um, sponsored content and we've, um, in, in similar ways that, that Shane talks about, it's not, it's not charged on the page view. We actually measure the amount of time people spend reading mm -hmm. and that's how we've charged for the, the branded content and that's been pretty successful. We also don't think there's necessarily one way that all, all content can be monetized, uh, and, and we hope to offer different types. But we're, we definitely see it as a business long term, and in fact, somewhat opposite, we, we're actually monetizing and um, experimenting with, with how we do that a lot sooner on Medium than we did on Twitter. And we went years on Twitter and raised mm -hmm. a lot more money before, than we did at Medium. Do we have any questions? Because if not, I'm so happy because I have other questions. Um, I wanted to ask you, have you, you have a, you're going to make some sort of an announcement tonight about Medium. Can you give us a hint about what, not what it is necessarily, but what's yeah. the direct, what are you guys well, talking it's, about? Well, it's a bunch of things. We're, we're hosting an event here in town um, that is, uh, where we're, we're announcing a number of things. A bunch of them are product related and just advances and refinements on what you can do on Medium and how you can, how you can use it as, as a platform, whether you're um, more on the commercial and professional side or on the individual personal side. Um, so a bunch of product stuff. There's not one big thing. There's some new partnerships that we're gonna be announcing as well. And um, some hints as to how we see the business side working out, we're gonna talk about. Um, I have one quick question for Tim, and then w I want to run another video. But Tim, you this morning I just read that um, Huffington Post is trying to unionize. Do you have any comment on that? Or? Sh Shane's my lawyer on that. Thing. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, look. I think the bottom line is uh, there's a tremendous amount of momentum in that space uh, right now, and I would say that. Uh, in some degree, a very positive momentum because I think the digital content properties have gotten really important. I mean, essentially, we, we bought the Huffington Post that had 20 million uniques. It's now got over 200 million. It's number one. So we're in you know 15 or 17 countries, and uh, you know it's probably singularly one of the largest digital, one of the largest media properties ever created overall. So I think you know the evolution of where uh, unions have been. It's probably a natural migration for them to look at digital companies. Uh, overall, and uh, like I think it's, a, it's just like everything else we're talking about, the migration of all the models James was up here talking about, and, and I'm sure Zuckerberg will talk about the you know, virtual reality. As these things keep moving, the ecosystems around them keep moving. And, and I, you know, I'm interested in Shane's take. We, we're just getting into this right now, but it's... Uh, I think it's about to do about nothing. Yeah, Who cares? They can yeah. unionize if they want. The one thing that I will say about that trend is it's funny because when I come out here, I'm like, I wish media could, more media could come. You know, there was that panel yesterday about North versus South, you know, LA versus, and now there's Silicon Beach. But, you know, we have a lot of people that come out of school. They've never had another job. They don't know what a strike price is. We gave away $800 million of stock options. And then we had a, a holiday party and just gave out a million dollars in cash. Nobody cared about the options. They were like, a million dollars in cash, that's great. You know, most of them would rather have $3,000 raise than $300,000 stock option, which is a problem because then you're giving out all these op options and they're not actually working. But if you look at unionizing, you say, okay, well, th they're basically saying, I want the 3,000 versus the 300,000. And so in media, you kind of wish- Well, is that here. really the choice that they're get given? $300,000 Well, because it's all option? based on comps. So what happens oh, is they, you say, well, is Gawker or, or you know, whoever else is unionizing and the Guardian, are, is the Guardian giving out stock options? No, so then we give out anything based on comps. And I think that, in, in, you know, here people know exactly what a strike price is and they know what they're, you know, the, and the exit and the secondary market and all that right. stuff. 
and a lot of times in media, it just doesn't, it doesn't you have a total different conversation on the East Coast than you would in exactly. Valley about right. this. Exactly. Um, so with all this discussion about video and mobile and, and how to create viral ads and things that people really want to see, I want to just play a clip for the thing that was sort of probably the most viral um, video that we saw last year, and it had nothing to do with advertising, and it was, um, I'm curious for everyone, we're going to end on that, so can we play that clip? And it is hey everyone, yesterday Governor Chris Christie challenged me to the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Governor, I accept your challenge. And after I dump this bucket of ice on my head, I get to nominate three new people to challenge. So I'm going to challenge Bill Gates, my partner at Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg, and Netflix's founder and CEO, Reed Hastings, to do this within the next 24 hours. So you have 24 hours to do this, or you have to donate $100. All right, here we go. That was really cold. We're running out of time, but I, I want to just take one, maybe I'll ask, um, well, I'll open it up to anybody. If you want to give an explanation for why you think that was such a big and viral phenomenon, what worked so well with that? Well, I think that there's a movement in the world, and let's talk about the internet, there's a movement towards positivity. There's a movement, you know, Gen Y realizes, hey, we have to clean up this mess and we got to do it daily in our actions. So I think you see an increase in environmental programming, social justice. I think you see a, a, a movement, and I know we did it. We, tr you know, sort of try to do more things like prison reform than Poo Poo Kaka and the Bum Bums, you know, so we, which is a joke. Um, <laughs> but I think with, with something that is actually positive, Mm -hmm. and something that has a change, mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot more chance of acceptance and going viral because people realize they want to be entertained, but they also want something to be positive. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the, what this program showed was the best attributes of the net. It, it, it gained momentum with search and social. It kept credibility because it was authentic. It created community. When you start thinking about products and brand building, these are the essential principles mm -hmm. that everybody wants to be able to capture. And so it did it so simply and so uh, relevantly. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's inspiring. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to the audience, too. Thank you.